welcome everybody this morning. All the fun that we have, the things that we get going on, it's just just a good day to praise the Lord. I was thinking and looking at a few things this morning, or last night studying and different times studying, <clears throat> and was just observing as I go through this life and this world, have you ever noticed how much negativity there is? And how folks are looking, you know, I preached here a few Sundays ago about how folks are looking to believe something bad. They want to latch on to whatever, the worst side of anything that they can get. They want to hook to it. And it's the same with words. If a word has two meanings and somebody opens it up and says something, they're going to jump to the most negative conclusion that they possibly can. Why is that, you reckon? Because that's human nature. That's what makes money for some people. Because they, you think about some of these uh, national lie magazines, that's what they, that's how they made their money, telling, telling really bad things about people and bringing ugliness about. And people want to believe it. You know, even if it's proven completely untrue, there's still something in the back of their mind. Oh, it's probably something to it, or it wouldn't have got started. So as we're thinking about that, I want to look, and we'll hone in on something this morning. Deuteronomy 5, chapter 5, we're just going to go from uh, verses 6 through 9 on Deuteronomy chapter 5. Okay? Starting at verse 6 in Deuteronomy chapter 5. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And I was thinking about as Christians, if we put our faith and trust in, in Christ, he has brought us out of bondage from death into life, okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting at, and now at verse 7, Thou shalt have none other gods before me. And I was thinking, that's a little g, that's God's, whatever we're worshiping and putting before God. Whether it's money, whether it's looking for something, you know, some some nugget of truth to look down on somebody for. Any of that can be gods that we're worshiping, that we're looking for more than God. And verse 8 says, Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. And that includes God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, angels, and all these things that you see in some of these Supposed houses of worship, even these pictures of this um, Anglo guy that's hanging with the blue eyes that they claim is Jesus with the long, pretty, curly hair. Those are all graven images. And I know that's going to just blow the flip-flops off of some people because they think that it's such an honor to see that picture that somebody called Jesus. Jesus was not pretty. Not comely. He's not comely that we should desire him. So that little Anglo guy, I hate to break it to you, Jesus was a Jew, he is a Jew, dark. He's a little darker. He's not got the blue eyes. He's not got the red hair. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to break your heart on that. All these graven images that people want to bow to and pray to, you're wasting your time and you're going directly against godliness. Because he said, thou shalt not. He didn't change his mind on that, okay? Any likeness. Now that's that's the part that blow, uh, that'll blow you away. Not any likeness. In is in heaven, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Oh, how many people are serving that holy dollar? That's all that they want to do. Or they're serving their spouse. That's the only thing. If you put them between you and God, God can take them away from you. Whoever it is or whatever it is that you put between you and God that you worship more than God, you're in danger of losing because he's not going to put up with it. Okay? In order to serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, and look at this, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, jealous God. 
Now, everybody knows what jealousy is. That's a bad thing, so that makes him a bad God, right? Wrong. The first definition of jealous is the one that folks want to jump to because you always go to the worst side of anything. Fearful that a person uh, may love or prefer someone else. Okay. God's not fearful. He's not, he's not that kind of jealous. Full of envy is the second. God's not full of envy. He's full of love. Let's look at the third one. Watchful in keeping or guarding something. There's our God. He's a jealous God. He's watchful in keeping us and guarding us, protecting us. The fourth one is close, watchful, and suspicious. God is closely watching us. And he's suspicious of those that are coming in to try to take us off, to try to make us worship them instead of him, to try to drag us off and keep our attention. Oh, you know how too busy you are to pray, how too busy you are to study God's word, how too busy you are giving all of our time and stuff to something other than a holy God rather than praising and worshiping him so that we can have a joy and peace. We're chasing rainbows, chasing that next. And I get how much is going to be enough, just a little bit more. It's kind of like that uh, one John Fogarty song, Someday Never Comes. That little bit more never comes if we allow it to keep. And have seen that one commercial on TV where they, you know, the, the one's holding a dollar and on the fishing pole and, oh, you almost had it. You almost had it. And that's the way it is with folks that are looking for happiness in, in money and things. The devil's sitting there with his little fishing pole going, you almost had it. You almost had it. Get away from that God a little more. You almost had it. Come on to me. And he's trolling them right on out. And they're running and running. And they don't even know what they're doing. They're looking for ways to get away to drag you away from God. Another, I was thinking about jealousy. That wasn't exactly how we were rolling with that this morning, but that's where it went. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was talking to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 1. If we have time, we'll go through the whole chapter. There's a lot in here. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians, verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. I was thinking about that. You know, entertain me for a minute. Put up with me just for a minute. Just listen for just a minute. I know right now because some false teachers have come in and told you a bunch of stuff that you think that I'm an idiot now suddenly. But just bear with me and listen and hear me out for a minute. It's kind of what he's saying, you know. Just don't. Um, Think this through for just a second. Give me just a little bit of time. For I am jealous, oh, there's that word again, over you. And what's he say? With godly jealousy. And see, we just explained how you can have godly jealousy. You want to protect those who you have trained up in the word, who you are teaching and guiding, who are your spiritual flock. You want to protect them. Because you don't want somebody coming in telling them lies and getting them to believe it. Let's look at the rest of this. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. I want to make sure that you know what you need to know. That I can present you as good Christians growing in the faith when Christ should come. Verse 3 says, but I fear lest by any means is the serpent beguiled. What's that? She beguiled Eve. How did he beguile her? He, how do you put it nice? He suckered her. He twisted things up so that she believed a lie. He coaxed her into something. A lot of people being coaxed into something, even though they know it's wrong. They'd be coaxed into doing something. Through his subtlety, Slickness. He's shrewd. Got a lot of these slick talkers coming up with a lie 
trying to load people up on a bus to carry them to hell with them. The problem is some of them actually believe the lie so much until they're very sincere preaching and teaching and spreading their heresy and their lies and they don't even know that they're dragging people to hell because they have been beguiled. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. All of those that want to complicate Christ, they want to give you the 10-step plan to being saved as no such animal. They want to give you the exact beautiful sinner's prayer that you must pray exactly in order to be saved. Let me find that in the book here, in the Bible. It ain't in there. It says, believe in your heart and call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. And confession is made unto salvation. Now, that's that would be at the best a three-step plan, wouldn't it? And it all happened simultaneously. Simplicity. Look at this. For if he had that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Now, another gospel. There's folks going around with a book they claimed another gospel. Paul right here was predicting that. It's not another gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? It has nothing to do with the true and the living Jesus Christ. A lot of people have been beguiled because the people that are spreading it actually believe it. They are, in their heart and mind, they believe that it's truth, that it's truth of God when it's not. It's not this Jesus Christ. It is another. It's a created being that they're made up. And they're spreading it. And that truth will not hold up in the day of judgment. Because that's not the blood of the Savior. That's the blood of a, a hoax, for lack of a nice way to put it. For I suppose... I was not a whip behind the very chiefest apostles. Now, Paul's saying, you know, they come to you with all their credentials telling you how much they studied and how much they know. I'm not behind any of them because I got the Holy Spirit. I got Jesus Christ that taught me what he's telling them. But though I be rude, and that's, oh, uh, I'm not courteous. I'm impolite. I'm rough in manner, you know, the way that I, you know, sometimes I'm a little tough. Though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. Just because I'm not being not really sugarcoating it for you, don't mean I'm an idiot. Whenever I throw it out there harsh and in, in full form with no sugar on it, it's still the word of God. It's still what to feed your spirit with the truth of Jesus. We have been truly made manifest among you in all times. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? So I come to you humbly. Is that offensive to you? Because I didn't come in yelling at you, telling you what you had to do. Sometimes people want to be told what to do. And if you tell them, look, you have freedom in Christ. You can make mistakes. You can live and learn. And he will teach you. He will guide you. And they're like, no, I need to, I need you to write down the rules of the do's and don'ts so I can I can keep it up and I can have a checklist to know if I'm a good Christian or not. You're gonna know if you're a good Christian or not by, by the Holy Spirit guiding you. You're gonna know if you're a Christian or not whenever you know if you have the Holy Spirit in you because you've actually called on Jesus to save you. You've actually believed he is who he says he is. He's not some created being. He is God in flesh came to save you from yourself. Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Didn't charge anything for it. Back then, the Corinthians, you couldn't have anybody speak for anything without a fee. It's fee-based society. Kind of like it is in the U.S. sometimes. If you, anybody comes in a guest speaker, oh, you got to pay him. If you, anybody does anything, you got to pay him. Nobody's... I was talking to some folks about this the other day. People do not respect something they don't have to pay for or work for. 
that's why it's so hard for salvation for them to accept it true and free because anything worth having you got to work for right with salvation you don't have to work for it you're going to work once you get it because you want to you want to you want to honor that savior but it's not a tick mark requirement where you can say well i worked harder than that brother or sister that i done better and the difference in the respectability if you have to pay somebody the more you have to pay them the more knowledge and skill they have as a pastor or preacher right I mean that well, surely that one that's preaching heresies up there for two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year has a lot better gospel than I have preaching it out of you know for the pennies or whatever or for whatever happens. I don't really care anything about any of that. The gospel's free. The gospel's true. Okay? It's to everybody. But people don't want to accept that something of value didn't cost you anything. And actually, it's not free. It cost God everything. He had to empty himself of his glory, come down and live and die and be one of us sin-free. Verse 8 says, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them, to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking in me. The brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdened unto you, and so I will keep myself. Never cost you anything. I'm not going to start now. Taking care of you is what he's telling them. I'm going to keep preaching the truth. And don't let my lack of taking from you undermine the truth that I'm preaching. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you, and he says, he says basically, wherefore, why? Because I love you not or I don't love you? God knows. So when anybody starts trying to bring somebody down, Look at why. Somebody's looking at the negative side. Try to figure out why and try to pray about it because God knows. God knows your heart. He knows my heart. He knows why we're doing what we're doing. He knows that we're worshiping dollars. We're worshiping trucks. We're worshiping buildings. Worshiping accounts. He knows what we're worshiping. But what I do that I will, that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. When I was reading that, I was thinking, you know, people will talk trash about somebody else just to try to make themselves look better. Or they'll pick on one thing that somebody misspoke and they'll just zero in on it and hang on to that one thing. They won't look at any good that anybody's done or how hard anybody's worked to try to uplift but that one time that they got angry and tried to tear down is whenever they're going to be. That's going to be the focus. It's going to be the negative. Look at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Now, whenever I was reading that, I was looking through some different things last night, and I was thinking about the apostles, folks transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Now, depending on how you look at it, they was 13 apostles, 12 plus Paul, okay? In order to be a true apostle, and the apostle is the same as an um, emissary at an at a, uh, embassy, it can speak directly for them, for God, for Christ, okay? It's like his emissary. Well, since... All of those died. There's been no more. He had to be trained for three years directly by Christ to be an apostle. So now those are running around here in this, and I'm not trying to throw shade on anybody, but anybody that calls themselves an apostle is misguided or an absolute liar 
or just don't understand what an apostle is, okay? If you were trained personally by Jesus Christ, you can be an apostle. If you are really a follower of Christ, you can be a disciple. We should all be disciples of Christ, but them that are barking at their apostles are misguided, misinformed, and just plain wrong. They're probably telling you a lot of other stuff that's wrong too. They're giving you the wrong spirit. They're giving you the false Christ. They're not apostles. And I don't want to hurt their feelings, but they need to really do a check up and ask Christ if he's trained them for three years personally. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So those that want to transform themselves to be something they're not, to uplift themselves, tell you what a great apostle they are? No. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So those that are masquerading as great apostles for Christ are misguided at best. They're devils in a suit at worst. They're trying to lead you the wrong direction. They have either been beguiled or beguiling you. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. Now watch this real close. As he goes through this, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord. So it's not, this is not a godly thing that he's saying. He's just saying, watch this for a second. But as if it were foolishly, in the confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after flesh, I will glory also. So you want to see about a pedigree? You want to see about degrees and things of who's who? I'll tell you who's who's what Paul's saying. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage. If a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, if he comes in here acting all bold and pious, you can give him a lot of credit rather than looking at the truth. He comes in here telling you how great he is, how much he knows about the Bible, and you don't check him up. You don't check the truth you already know. You don't check the truth in your heart. You don't check the spirit to make sure it's the spirit of Christ. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak, howbeit Whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in the labors and abundant in stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths oft. Whatever they've done, I've done it more and I've done it better. And that the way that I've heard some preachers sitting up there preaching about, I went downtown, this and that, and I was preaching to these folks that could have killed me in a second. Well, you know what? Every time you drive down the highway, you could have been killed in a second. All it takes is one bobble from one idiot. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck at night. And a day... I have been in the deep, in journey, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren. Paul saying they talking about how tough they had it. Cry me a handful. He said. I've had all this. This is not what I'm using. This is not what I'm preaching about. Even though all this happened to me, I'm preaching about Jesus, the true Jesus, crucified and raised from the dead. The God in flesh, not the false Christ and the false books that are coming along in years to come, but the true and the living God that came to save that which was lost, to reconcile us to himself not the one that wants to come in and control you and make a robot out of you and make everybody walk in lockstep to whatever my opinion is. That's not a pastor. That's a dictator. That's not a preacher. I don't even know what you would call that. It is somebody who 
wants to be in full control. And he's telling you, don't let these people bring you into bondage. Don't let them tell you they can take your salvation away from you. They didn't give it to you, did they? They don't get to decide when you get it and when you don't. You call on the name of the Lord and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? It'll be between a personal relationship between you and Jesus Christ when you believe on him. In verse 27, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So with all these things going on, the only thing that worries me, the only thing that bothers me is that these churches are taken care of, that they're fed the truth of God's word, that they're not led off to some fool's errand, worshiping idols, worshiping days, picking up heathenism, bringing it into the church, all these things, and being controlled by somebody who's money hungry, who's just teaching them a false Christ. Verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended? And I burn not. You, think, you know, you think none of this affects me? You think it don't hurt me? Whenever you go off and you put yourself in bondage and you listen to a bunch of false teachers and I've done giving you the truth of Christ and they come in and say, oh yeah, that's true. But let's add all of this to it. Add all this back so that I can control you. Religion creeps in and eats up Christianity, and eats up the true body of the church, and stifles it. It wraps it up like a mummy wrapped up in cloth to where it can't move, and it's, and it's dead, to where it can't spread, other than the way that the falseness, the false gods that it want to spread. Some of these people standing up front want you to worship them, what Paul was talking about. Look at all their degrees. Look at all of their pedigrees, how wonderful of people they are. None of it matters. It's got to be about your relationship with Christ, the simplicity in Christ. Verse 30 says, If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities, the things that keep me humble. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of Damascus with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in the basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Now, the simplicity in Christ, and he's talking about Escape this escape with a garrison after him. No matter what's coming against you, who's coming after you, if you're striving to do God's will, he will see you through it one way or another. He'll either let you escape out the back door, they'll walk right by you and never see you. He'll take care of his own if we're in his will doing what we're supposed to be doing. Even in death, he'll take care of us because to be absent of the body is to be with the Lord. So even when we die, if we are killed in the name of Jesus or for the name of Jesus, we'll be in his presence. So he will take care of us either way. And the simplicity of Christ, I was thinking, I even looked up simplicity. Simplicity is freedom from difficulty. When you say, take my yoke, it's easy. Salvation is easy. Painless is one of the definitions. Absence of show or pretense. Now, there you go. The truth of Jesus Christ is an absence of show or pretense, and it's sincerity. So how do you figure out if the preaching is sincere, if it's absence of... Do we have to have smoke and mirrors to get people to listen to God's Word if they truly want to hear God's truth? What have I got to do to entertain somebody to get them to listen to the whole truth of God's word, to understand that salvation 
is about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the church. It's about my personal relationship taking and understanding that he died personally for me. God himself came, put himself on the tree. He bled. He died. He paid it all. All I have to do is call on him and believe in him. And those try to complicate things, try to add to it. I've got enough to answer for whenever I get there. I'd hate to be some of these people that are out spreading lies on and blaming it on God so that they can be in control and they can have all your money. I don't want none of it. God will bless me with what I need. I'm not going to be out there asking you to, oh, well, we need an extra jet, you know, for the church where I can fly out and spread God's word. Well, he ain't never told me that. There's, there's ways to spread God's word that's fairly inexpensive. There's tapes. There's CDs. There's Facebook. There's ways for God's word to get out there without spending millions of dollars and, and saying in the posh hotels and fluffing yourself. Now, they would have all, them that claim to be apostles, looked down on Paul today, those that, of today's standards, because he's rough and gruff and works for everything he's got and tries to carry the gospel at his own expense because he loves that Savior that reached down and basically slapped him down and said, Paul, quit being an idiot. It's time for you to come over to my side. Now, he done pretty much that to me. He said, you know, you need to listen up. You need to live for me. And if you listen, he's talking to you too.